Thank you for auditing the Always Positive New Music Review Show, where a French professor is extremely excited to talk about the new album Pink Friday 2 by Nicki Minaj. And if you don't know much about this channel, I often will tie in my own personal history with music into the reviews that I make. Uh, this bothers some people, so if, if that idea bothers you of, of hearing whatever I have to say, who the hell am I, then you, you can skip off, you can, you can jump off. But I hope that sometimes my observations, my personal relationship to an artist, might be telling about their work and might be interesting for you to listen to. So one of the primary bits of mythology, of lore, of this channel is what I call my mid-twenties music death. So I'm now currently in my middle forties, and I've had this theory, uh, and I'm not the only person to have this theory, I might have even... <laughs> I might have even heard someone else say it, and I've taken it for myself, so tell me in the comments where else you've heard this. But when you hit like 24, 25 years old, it's pretty easy to just think that all new music is bad and just sort of let music die for you. That music was good when you were young, and once you're no longer young, it's not... Okay, this pink scarf is too hot. <clears throat> I was trying to be in theme with Nicki Minaj, but I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna sweat up my wife's scarf. That's no good. You know, so, so in this mid-twenties music death that I experienced, you know, this is around 2003, 2005, and there were a couple times where things bubbled up, where there was a chance that before I started this channel, and the reason I started this channel was specifically to fight that new music death, because I'm, I realized there's no possible way that music reached its peak when I was 23 years old, right? That's just not possible. There were times where it seemed as though I was going to get back into music. Uh, 2013 especially, when I went through my divorce and a couple albums, actually three albums, saved my life. Jesus, Random Access Memories, Bankrupt. But really the one that sticks out in my mind is 2010. So I just moved here to Rochester from Santa Barbara where I got my doctorate. And all I listened to was my beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy. You know, of all the musicians that carried over from my youth into my adulthood, Kanye West was the most consistent. Which works out for me pretty well, because he stayed so current and was able to help, uh, help me st stay aware of what was happening in music, even if I wasn't paying attention. The thing that happened when I listened to my beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy was I heard Nicki Minaj's verse on Monster. And... Like, when we're thinking, like, what are the top ten verses of all time? I think Monster is probably top three. Like, that's how good of a verse it is. How revolutionary it is. How just devastating that verse was to hear the first time. Now, it was devastating for me for a couple reasons. One, I grew up misogynist. I didn't know I was misogynist. I didn't think that I had a problem with female rappers, but I definitely did. It was only when Missy Elliott came out that I started to understand that maybe I could like some female rappers and then Lauren Hill. But there was something about that monster verse that was just, it wasn't, it wasn't a 4A verse, right? So 4A is when you say something is good 4A, right? <laughs> like, this is a good 4A uh, fake pink scarf, but it's, you know, it's like, Nicki Minaj was not good for a female rapper. She destroyed everybody on that track, including Jay-Z. Now, I like Jay-Z's verse. Godzilla. I love... Actually, I like... I defend Jay-Z's verse. But that verse absolutely wrecked me. And I would listen to it, and by the time, like... <laughs> You know, within like a month of listening to, to that album, I had that whole verse memorized and all the different voices and all the different styles and it got me so excited. Now, mind you, I was 33, right? So I wasn't paying it. I was the same age as Kanye. I wasn't paying attention to new music. I didn't know who Nicki Minaj was. I wasn't listening to her underground tapes. I wasn't hip on the scene. I didn't know anything. I just knew this name. And then I see at a certain point, next week, Nicki Minaj will be releasing her first album, Pink Friday. So, this is the album that <laughs> did not help me with my mid-twenties music death. I pinned so much hope. You want to see how much hope I had in this album? Let me show you one of my favorite music artifacts. The way we listen to music changes all the time. Statistically, most of you who are watching this have probably never pirated anything and have only listened to things on streaming. That's, like, most likely. Most of you have probably never bought a CD for yourself to listen to, okay? Because most of my audience is young. And so I want to show you this beautiful object that shows both where I was in 2010 and where the music industry was. 
This is my copy of Nicki Minaj Pink Friday, which I bought on November 22nd, 2010, the day it came out. I was so certain, not only is this going to be, someone's gonna reconnect me with what's happening in rap right now, but this is gonna be the future of female rap artists. Finally, this has happened. I'm gonna love it. I love it so much that I bought it on iTunes. <laughs> Okay, I bought it on iTunes and I burned it onto a CDR. Okay, that's that's how old school we are. I, I would drive around listening to it <clears throat> in my Prius, peak 2010. All right, so that's how I have this disc. But I'm gonna tell you something. I don't think I listened to it twice. I mean, what the hell happened? Where's Monster? Where is Monster Nikki? The first like four songs, like fine, and the song with Eminem's okay, and definitely uh, Doing On Em is great. Like Doing On Em is that's what I bought this album for. But the rest of it is this like pop mishmash and singing and just pop and pop and pop and singing and singing and singing and singing. The promise of Monster was completely abandoned. And now in my old age, I understand, I have the wisdom to understand that she wasn't trying to be, she wasn't trying to be, I don't know, uh, some kind of absolute rap master. She was trying to be a pop star and a rapper. She was following the template laid out by Missy Elliott. Be able to sing, be able to rap, be interesting and be different. But it was interesting because this album really killed... <laughs> rap music for me. Because <laughs> if this had been better, I think I would have had more faith that there was more good rap happening out there and I would have looked it out. Now, listen, it's my fault, not Nicki Minaj's fault. I re-listened to it again. It's not as bad as I remember. But it's definitely not monster after monster after monster after monster. So I checked out. I checked out in the Nicki Minaj game. I didn't pay any attention. I did at one point hear the song Bees in the Trap, and that became one of my absolute favorite songs. I would play it on repeat. I didn't, <laughs> at the time, I didn't even know what a trap was, so I thought it was like, like a trap <laughs> to catch bees. I, I thought bees had to be some kind of like honey sexual reference, okay? That's, that's how old I was when I was younger. And then I started this channel in 2018. So I was ready, you know, I, I was ready to, to embrace with my new mindset, the ability to understand and contextualize and forgive artists for not giving me exactly what I wanted them to give me. You know, I'm a lot younger now that I'm older and I'm able and I was waiting for that Nicki Minaj album to come out. She did release an album in 2018, a couple months before I started this channel. So for the five, six years that I've done this channel, I just haven't talked about Nicki Minaj. I've thought about Nicki Minaj. I taught about Nicki Minaj. Behind you, you'll see a book there called God Save the Queens by Kathy Iandoli. It is a great, if you're interested in the history of female rappers and histories of, of women in hip hop, that is an absolute masterful book. So I sort of took that, I did some other research, and I of course watched FD Signifier's video about Nicki Minaj, which is another one of his just masterpieces of, of research and presentation. And I eventually taught my hip hop class where I teach an entire 50 minute class mostly about Nicki Minaj. So I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm catching up. And what I realized through all that research is, you know, the pink print is really the thing that she's best known for that really shows her influence and her power. I've listened to it a couple of times. It's, it's great. It's a better version of, of Pink Friday. But what I would do is I, I had a little slide for my students. And I, I told them, you know, like, like, what are the things that makes Nicki Minaj so important? So I'm, I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you my slide, okay? And then we're going to apply this slide to this new album, Pink Friday, okay? What is the pink print for female rappers in the 21st century, okay? Strong voice, empowerment. Excellence in lyricism. Multiple voices, personalities. Rap, pop, crossover. Sexual power, both in terms of their pleasure and also in terms of a transactional nature. This is the thing that bothered me the most, that despite the fact that a lot of female rappers are millionaires, they still talk about selling their uh, vagina uh, for uh, bags and, and cars. Uh, very intelligent, so not playing on any kind of negative stereotypes of lack of education or intelligence. Very poised and uh, intentionally sh flexing their intelligence. Uh, very... <clears throat> Shocking, 
obviously, especially with the sexuality, uh, and very, very body-centered, very focused on the female body and female body parts. So you know, that was the way that was the way that I can. Wait, where did I put my actual notes here? Okay, there I am. So that was the way that I contextualized and taught Nicki Minaj. If you think there's any other thing I should add in there, please tell me in the comments. So when I approach this album, I have all this stuff flying around. I have the great disappointment of. <laughs> I remember I was at the YMCA, the one that's down my street, and, and they sold it to a church, and it's now a church, but I still go there because there's a Pokemon gym there, and I'll sometimes go there and put, I only ever put a Togekiss in that gym. I don't know, it's like a weird uh, tradition that I have. Like, I remember driving in that gym with my kids in the back and hearing this album and getting to, like, track five and just being like, damn it, okay? That's how strong <laughs> my disappointment was with this. But I'm taking my disappointment of that, my love of Monster, my appreciation of F how FD Signifier contextualized Nicki Minaj, the things that I taught, and then I have this album. Of that whole list that I showed you, I'm going to take some things out. It's not really about female pleasure. Even the sex songs, I would say, are not about female pleasure, which I think is transgressive and interesting, but they're more about female sexual acumen, the skill of sex, which feels weird because it feels like if you're super famous, then like, you know... It must be hard when everyone's trying to please you to focus on being good at pleasing other people. And that goes in all areas, not just sexual. There you go. No transactional sex, as far as I can tell, on this entire album. There might have been one reference. You can tell me in the comments if I'm wrong. But in general, this is not like, you know, I'm going to F you so good, you're going to buy me a jet. None of that stuff. Nothing here is particularly shocking, except for the emotional bits, which I'll talk about. And thankfully, it's not really body-centered. There's maybe one or two songs that veer into talking about her butt and her boobs and stuff, but in general, it doesn't really go there. And what I'd like to add is that I think she's adding a new pink print. I think this album is laying out a new blueprint of how to age. Because if rap music has been brutal on male rappers aging, and it has been, I talk about it a lot, but when I was growing up, the old school rappers were completely discarded, okay? Cool Modi got no respect in the late 90s. Sugar Hill Gang got no respect. Grandmaster Flash got no respect. Nobody of the original old school got respect. That's changed over time. Now we allow rappers to age. We, are, we allow Jay-Z to be 50 and still important, etc. But what about female rappers? I mean, if male rappers are not allowed to, to, to grow... What about female rappers, especially when female rappers often use their body and their youth and their beauty as a marketing tool, as a means of staying relevant? How can you be, what is she, 42 now? 41, 42? I don't know. She's either 41 or 40. How can you be in your 40s and be talking about your magical pee power and all that stuff? Okay? These are the questions. And I think this album does it really well. It talks about motherhood without being exclusively about motherhood. It talks not really about aging, but it comes from a position where she isn't trying to just say all the same stuff. I was shocked at how not bored I was by this album. And part of it's because it's such a long album. I'll talk about that in a second. But I was shocked that she wasn't just saying the same things over and over again. She wasn't just going around saying, these bitches is my sons, and those bitches are my sons, and those and those and those, and all these bitches are my sons. I expected it to just be that on that on that on that, and it really isn't. There's a lot of variation. So I think she's laying out an idea here, you know, that you can stay sexual, but focus less on sexuality. You can talk about your body, but focus less on your body. You can talk about the natural life cycle, not of women, but of human beings, of growing up, of having families, of more complicated relationships. This album also deals and gets very personal. And I think that's the thing that she maybe brings the most to the table here, is making a painfully personal album. Painfully personal album, which hurts. <laughs> this album emotionally hurt me in a good way. Now, about the, the length of the album. I call it Drake Bloat. It should really be called Migos Bloat. A uh, different album, Rap Capital, uh, explains how the history of bloat in rap music came with Migos and their album The Culture 2, or Culture 2, which was intentionally filled with more songs than they wanted to have on there because each stream 
equals a quarter of a cent or whatever, or one one hundredth of a cent. Therefore, more streams, more songs equals more money. Drake takes this to its logical extreme, and it's just the way that the business works. So if you want to take rap seriously, if you like really want to take it seriously and not just dismiss it because of this, you have to come up with ways of forgiving this and just say, don't hate the player, hate the game, player, right? Like you have to... Because listen, if this is the way it was in, 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 in 1999, then Jay-Z Volume 3 would have had an extra 10 songs on it. And at least eight of those would have been bad. Like, it's just the way that it happens. So, and then the problem is, is that, <laughs> the problem is, what's the, the one thing that no one wants to make? No one wants to make a mid-album. People don't mind making bad albums or great albums, but, but the mid-album is the problem. This whole system... This bloat system encourages mid because you're forcibly going to have highs and you're forcibly going to have lows, which is going to put you in the C's. Okay, I'm a teacher, right? It's going to put you in the mid. I'm a teacher. So if you have an album, if you have a student who gets all A's and all F's, they're going to end up with a C, right? Just why didn't you just, why didn't you just give us all the A's? So what I'm going to do, one of my favorite... <laughs> One of my favorite criticisms I ever got. I got an A on, on a paper I, I wrote for my, uh, my grad advisor. Uh, it was about the, the father figures in Hassin. And I had, a, I had a kind of a goofy conclusion, which I thought was interesting. He circled it and wrote, Je vous ferai le grand service d'écarter cette conclusion. I will do you the great service of removing this conclusion. He still gave me an A, despite the fact he just tore up the last page because I just went off. So I'm going to do her the great service of cutting this album down to 12 tracks and 37 minutes. Now, before the Barbies get mad, there's not even really... Okay, there's one bad song. There's one song on here that is a howling pile of dog shit. Excuse my words. But the... Oh my God, it is, un it is so unlistenable. I listened to it the first time at the gym, and while I was on the elliptical, I went, ugh, when somebody started singing and rapping. I'll let you think about who that is. <sighs> Rough. But for the rest, the rest of the songs I'm cutting out, it's not that they're terrible. It's just I don't think they're up to the standard of the rest. So I listened to them once. I took notes on them. I'll tell you what I think about them. One of them's even pretty good. The J. Cole song, which I think is a cut, but I think it's pretty good. But I think the album would be stronger without it. I think if we cut it down to 37 minutes, 12 tracks, it could maybe even be an album of the year contender. Now, it's really hard because, like, you can't, you can't do that, right? Like, you, you can't do that. You can't take out almost 50% of the album and then say that the album is the greatest. That's, that's the problem the way the system is here. Uh, I'm going to tell you about my favorite parts of the album, too. But before I do, uh, please smash the like bucket. Please subscribe. Um, if you type in the letters A-V-A-A, -A, that stands for awesome video, as always. I will heart those comments every single time. I read all my comments. That's the way you know that I've seen yours. You can put it anywhere you want in the comments. Event always, someone asks in my comment section, what does A-V-A-A -A -A mean? <laughs> I want to tell them. It stands for you didn't watch the video. But anyway, you, you can do that. Um, that's my, my little pitch here. You know, I don't, I don't do... Uh, I don't do uh, sponsorships or anything, so, you know, I, like, I don't think you need a VPN. And definitely don't ever, ever buy supplements. You don't need supplements. Okay, so let me tell you about my favorite track on the album. This is my stamp. This is my example song. This is in my... Now, here's a question. Would Nicki Minaj be better if she was only monster Nicki Minaj? I don't know. You know, maybe not, you know? Like, maybe I say that. Maybe I just want her to be bars and bars and bars and bars. But maybe the fact that she's so many different artists in one and that... Anyways, I don't have an answer to that question. You can tell me in the comments. It, like, is this a question that, that Nicki Minaj fans have? I don't know. But my favorite track on the album, if you know the album, you know, you know if you love Monster, the track you have to listen to is Big Difference. So click above the banana, above the books, Okay. Just an awesome track. Uh, crazily, it's done by Boogs, who like does a lot of beats, which I think are pretty forgettable, but this is just not. These weird sounds, forward and backward sounds, what it does is it's a perfect bed for her voice. Because she's odd, right? That's one of the great things about her, all of her different styles and rapping styles. So I feel the need to just have more oddness. You know, when we think about like Bees in the Trap, like that song is so weird. Like, that's what I want. I want weird, weird, weird stuff. 
very memorable chorus. It's a big difference between me and you. I ain't nothing like you, 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 or you. She's doing that thing where she's rhyming the word you with you. So it seems like she's being simplistic, but then of course she just flexes on all the verses and just shows her acumen as a rapper. Did I just use acumen twice in the same review? Uh-oh, Sky. This is why I don't have a script. I just have notes. So you never know when I might say acumen again. That means talent, by the way. It's a fancy word. Uh, or skill. When bitches be rapping, I'm laughing. It sounds like you trying to me. I'm who you dying to be. Will someone uh, cop all these groupies a ticket because I'm the one they dying to meet? You know, like, just rapping, laughing, trying to me, dying to be, dying to meet. You know, it's just like, it's... Very nice, very rhythmic, very interesting, very rich rhymes. The second verse, similar way. We not the same, you my opposite. I'm the queen, you my op and shit. The corniest bitches be pop and shit. Everything offend, uh, everything offend the fact I know you just dropped my shit. You know, all these very rich rhymes, multisyllabic, sometimes mosaic rhymes here, you know, opposite, op and shit. It's not the most complicated vocabulary, but what she does is she just raps really well and has this way of creating a rhythm and with these multiple voice sounds, you know? And then that was the second verse. In the middle of the second verse is this weird bell mix up and the bass just gets more booming and it just gets weirder and weirder and then comes back. And just the whole way through, I'm just listening to it. And this has that feeling of like, this is what I wanted 13 years ago. Do I wish that she did more of it? I don't know anymore. <laughs> I'm all confused. All right, so I'm gonna go through the rest of the album. All right, we got one of the 12 songs, which I think are keeps in my little uh, Nicki Minaj Pink Friday select. The first track is called Are You Gone Already? Last night, I went to the movies. A uh, movie theater just opened in my town. I was very happy. And I went to go see the new Godzilla movie because I love Godzilla. I'm not like a Godzilla guy, but I, I really do like Godzilla. Do you know what I wasn't expecting when I went to go see a Godzilla movie? I wasn't expecting to cry, <laughs> like a lot. I, I, I mean, first of all, I wasn't expecting to root. <laughs> I told a joke to my wife last night. I said, I was actually rooting for the people. Like I never root for the people in Godzilla. I always want Godzilla to just kill everybody. But for the first time, I was rooting for the people. And I said it would be like watching a porno and like wanting to know, oh, was the pizza good? <laughs> what toppings did you have on the pizza? You know, like it was this totally weird experience. But the real shock of Godzilla was that I was crying. Because that's not what you go to a Godzilla movie for. You go to a Godzilla movie for bum, 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 and, right? That's what you go for. But it's a great movie. You should, you should definitely go see it. All that is a way to say that I didn't know that I go to Nicki Minaj for catharsis, for a very touching song that completely wrecked me. Now, the first time I heard Are You Gone Already, obviously I'm just thinking, what, what's the deal? Like, like, like this, is just a, this is just a Billie Eilish song, you know? I mean, she's just copying a Billie Eilish song, and then you look at the credits, it says it's produced by Phineas, and then you kind of poke around, it seems like maybe Billie Eilish is actually contributing to it, which is kind of interesting, you know? And so I'm like listening, you know, it's when the party's over, just a beautiful song. It's a reminder of how great Billie Eilish is. Uh, and it's nice too because it helps to create a sort of bond between them, you know, like a sort of like group of equals, you know? I mean, um, how many bitches is Billie Eilish's sons? You know what I'm saying? Uh, I'm using that in the parlance of Nicki Minaj. I'm not actually using the B word. You understand what I'm saying? Anyways, so, so it turns out Based on my minimal research on my second time of listening to this album, I was on Lyric Genius, and it's about her dad dying. And it's about her dad not getting to meet her son, who was just born. So, how do you age in rap music? I think, I think the number one way you age in rap music is you just get more real. I think that's what it is. I think that's the, that's the answer for male rappers, female rappers, NB rappers, all of them. Whatever it is that you're doing, when you're young, you could be crazy and lit and turnt and crunk and all that stuff. But when you hit a certain age, you better start telling some truth or else people are gonna get bored, right? But this song, so, you know, I have a baby. Um, I, I have a couple teenagers and I have a baby. And my teenagers knew my parents very well my mom died in 2016. My dad died in February, you know, 10 months ago. And, uh, you know, so I have a baby. So my baby's never going to really know my father. And 
I just lost my shit. <laughs> I heard this song. I needed help. You booked a flight. In three days, you'd meet Papa. So she calls her son Papa, apparently, according to Lyric Genius. And she called her dad Papa. And then she describes what it is to be in the hospital, the waiting, the gazing, the painting, the raging, the raving, the pacing, the praying, the shaking. I must admit I was breaking. I must admit I was taking. I must admit my heart was racing. Telephone ring. He didn't make it. I just believed you waken. A memory in the making. Call me. Won't you call me? No, you're gone. I'm keeping it together right now. I do have, uh, I do have legitimate uh, goosebumps, which I get sometimes on this channel. But she's not just describing her dad being dead. She's describing him dying. And if you've ever had a parent die or ever had someone die in a hospital and there's the thing and you're waiting and waiting, she just described like the last week of my dad's life where I was going back and forth to the hospital trying to figure out what was going to happen. I cannot talk about this more without start crying. But it's like, God damn it, she's really describing it. And I don't know. I don't think there's any song that does this good of a job of discussing this pain of knowing that her child will not meet a loved parent. And that's a feeling that I have now. Like, God damn it. So <laughs> I just, I just hit stop and you know, my baby was playing, just hanging out, playing with blocks, playing with these little rings. I have her, got her a couple of drums and I'm just sitting there and just crying and just hugging her, you know? Cause like, she'll never get to meet my dad. She'll never get to meet my mom. That sucks. It's true. Feeling that truth is important. Hearing somebody reflect that truth back to me, even if it's Nicki Minaj who bees in the trap, even if it's some multi-millionaire who talks a lot about Chanel and Fendi and butt lifts, anacondas, like it doesn't matter. She got to a human truth that I did not know I needed right now. It's amazing. This whole second verse talking about the real Nika, the real Nika, like her real name. And she even says what date she's writing this song. It's 12 23 which was like a couple days ago. You know, it's just so real. Your baby's three. He's the best. Set me, set me, set me free. Why don't you come back to get me? Let me, let me be rich. Yes, but are you happy? All this guilt you carry is heavy. You already made your peace with me. One day you'll have to forgive mommy. But she knows, uh, she knows... But she knows you know too much already, tying into the sample. Why would anyone want to love me? <sighs> so um, if you're still here and you are a Barbie and you are mad at me because I say that some of these songs on this album are not great, I promise you nobody on earth appreciates this song more than I do, okay? So the very least, I want you to imagine me wearing a hat that 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 has that has this song title right that has are you gone already with a big foam finger and i'm its number one fan that's just how good and how meaningful and i'm joking about it because legitimately it's effectively emotional enough that if i keep talking about it i'm gonna lose it fortunately the next track is barbie dangerous that's another keeper standard kind of trap curl some of the songs here especially some of the more rap songs don't feel fully fleshed out but it's a nice verse i love this line name it rapper that can channel big papa and push out papa bear so she's talking about having her her baby who she apparently calls papa bear which is a weird it's a weird thing it's a weird thing to call your kid father i know it's popular in a lot of different communities that uh, are not uh mine so but it's anyways uh but i i love this idea because she's simultaneously talking about being a good mother while still being a great rapper. Um, I'm the queen of this rap shit. It's bohemian. You know, that's of all the things that she really does super well. I, I mean, I guess, you know, she didn't invent this style of rapping where you say something and then you do the little punchline at the end. I mean, I think I mean, Method Man did it a lot. You can tell me in the comments if you're a super rap person, uh, super rap history, who was the first person to do this kind of style of rapping where you sort of say one thing and then tag it with a little punchline. But I'm not sure anyone does it better than her. She may not be the first. She may be. I don't think she is. Uh, but she definitely is one of the best. The next track is another keeper, FTCU. It's a club banger. It's uh, apparently a sample from Walk a Flock of Flame. You want to talk about somebody whose career I completely missed? <laughs> I, I was not paying attention to rap music when Walk a F Is Walk a Flock of Flame the same guy who does that song about Pittsburgh, Black and Yellow? 
No, he's not. <laughs> it's a different guy, isn't it? That so that's how lost I am. Like that period of of music, <clears throat> I just get so mixed up that I don't know who's who, or is it that guy? Who does that black and yellow? Uh -huh. Then he had that super whack song about uh, Fast and Furious. Whew, man, that is Waka Flocka. It doesn't matter. You can tell me. In the I promise I'm not doing the thing of where I make a mistake just to get engagement. I legitimately forget who did that song. Um, but yeah, so uh, there's apparently a sample of that, but it's it's a great song on its own. I listened to the original. It's not just a, a direct copy. Nice low banging bass, simple drums. I was I was working, I was working out, and a lot of this album is a great album to work out. Nice high energy. I really like her verse. I tell them I'm the sleaze. They tell me, okay, prove it. I leave these bitches on red so they know that they blew it. Yeah, she's staying current. That's a term that kids these days use. I have a whole video on my spam channel about how I hate the term on red because it doesn't make sense because what you're actually saying is that it was red. So why are you saying it's unread? But that's a whole nother that's a whole nother video. I love how it builds with these two notes behind, like the verse like builds in a way it doesn't really need to, but it does. And she does a what's called a forced rhyme. Uh, invisible, which I think, you know, there's this whole kind of lineage to her and Lil Wayne. And so I like that because that's the Lil Wayne trick. Nice whispered chorus, very clever verse, you know. And, and then the, the second verse has this whole thing where she does like a one syllable thing and then a pause. And then she goes fast and then something with Iggy. And she just does that over and over and over again and for a whole verse. And it's, it's uh, again, I think she has to be underrated, even though a lot of, she might be overrated and underrated at the same time. I don't know, it doesn't make much sense, but I think it's true. And I think this verse, the second verse in this song, is a good example of that, because it's an interesting idea to have something pause, da 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 iggy, you know? Like, that creates its own interesting rhythm with her flow and with her cadence. Um, I do sort of wish that a song that's about fucking the club up were a little bit more, and I need to know. Okay, here's a real question for the for the comments. Am I, as a 46-year-old man, allowed to use the the word turnt? So what happens with uh, with black American slang is there becomes a certain point where it's acceptable, <laughs> where it's it's been so appropriated that it doesn't matter anymore. Now that's not fair. It's an unfair thing that happens to the culture, but that's the way that it is. Okay. Um, so am I allowed to say turnt? I don't think so. I think, I think the answer is no. But I do wish that this song was a little bit more turnt, <laughs> even using it properly. Listen, listen, I just got permission to say crunk like a decade ago. All right, next track is called Beep Beep. Uh, and I'm, this is another keeper, okay? So a lot of, a lot of the songs I'm taking out are gonna be from, from the soft middle of this album. It's kind of pedestrian, but it's good. The thing that shocked me is that it's not a Missy Elliott reference because, you know, it, it, if you're a fan of female rappers and you hear the words beep beep, you just go, who's got the keys to my Jeep, right? Not this. But I like it because it has these kind of horror, ghostly bell sounds and they modulate really nicely and the voice comes in before the drums do. I will say, there's a couple things, a couple things, please, Please take this in the spirit, okay? I'm older than you, Nicki Minaj, but you gotta watch your references. And I know this as a YouTuber. If I make a certain kind of reference, no one's gonna get it. So if you say, who wanna be a millionaire, lifeline? Like there's a couple ways of making old references. You know, you take someone like old uh, Open Mike Eagle, who will make references because he's old, but that's part of his shtick, is that he's like, not old, but whatever, he's a middle-aged guy and he's going through middle-aged questions and he raps about middle-aged things and one of those things is talking about things that he remembers and so when a middle-aged guy like me listens to his albums, I go, I remember that, <laughs> you know? Nobody beats the whiz, you know? I remember that commercial, whatever, right? That's not a specific example, but just an example of what it could be. Uh, but uh, there's a couple references on here which definitely show her age because Who Wants to Be a Millionaire was a popular TV show like 20 years ago. If I don't know you, is that beef? That's a funny line. Then we get to the first cut. I'm Fallen For You. Just the title I saw, I'm like, oh, this is going to be a skip right here. It's interesting stuff here with some violins in the production. Like, I don't like the violins, but they're interesting. They're different. Uh, I didn't say I thought it was good. I said I thought it was interesting. 
Uh, but, you know, I don't know. These bitches gotta show ass to have sex appeal. I like that line. That's an interesting line, like, implying that you don't need to have a good body to have sex appeal, which is obviously true. Uh, and so this isn't, again, it's not bad. It's just not up to the rest. Same thing with the next song, Let Me Calm Down, featuring J. Cole. I'm cutting this out for a reason. Now, there's things that are truly admirable about this song. I think this song is a great continuation of the work that Kendrick Lamar was doing on We Cry Together. We Cry Together, the song off of <laughs> Kendrick Lamar's album, I Don't Listen To. Thank God I'm not in a relationship like that right now. But I was, and I don't ever want to think about it. Not ever, 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 ever do I want to think about those emotions. It really conveyed those. But I like this song, because this song is, is like a more evolved back and forth. So when I saw J. Cole was on it, I thought it was going to be uh, Nikki is the, the female of the relationship, and J. is the, and Cole. What do we call him? Cole? Cole? J? Cole? J is Jay-Z, so Cole is J. Cole. He's everywhere right now. So I thought he was going to be the, the, the person, the male of the relationship. Not the case. But I really enjoy Nikki's verse because she seems like she is providing a service, <laughs> which is, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions about being in a relationship. One of the worst pieces of advice is my mother, God rest her soul, ever gave me was never go to bed angry. Yeah, that's terrible advice. Totally go to bed angry. <laughs> It's totally, it, if you're married, if you're in a committed relationship, you can wake up and you're going to be less angry and you can still have all the same opinions and you can hash them out. Because if you're angry and you're tired and you're still fighting, just let it go. So this whole line here, give me space while I'm really heated, how do rappers age? They age with wisdom, okay? They age with wisdom and this is wisdom, She's not having a song about how much she hates somebody and using all sorts of negative terms. It's just like, just give me space, which is often what's needed in a relationship. It's not glorifying toxicity in the same way that Kendrick Lamar was not glorifying toxicity, but it is describing toxicity. It is showing this song, hopefully, is showing ways to set boundaries or to set ways of, of, of interacting that are more helpful than just having knocked down teeth gnashing fights all the time. And then J. Cole comes in, and so I thought he was going to do like the, okay, that was for the ladies, now here's for the fellas. And I was all set to trash it, because I think, I just, I'm so sick of that, of that, that style. But it wasn't. He was great. <laughs> he had his whole verse. I still am cutting this song off the, off the, off the cut, but this is the best of the songs I'm cutting. Uh, I like it because he's not talking to her. He's talking to the guy in the relationship. He's like being a friend. Which is a bad position. Oh, I've been in that position a lot. Where you're like... <laughs> so if you're a emotionally poised, emotionally mature man, and you have friends who are couples, you often find yourself relating more to the women because men in general prefer... Uh, instead of growing emotionally, they prefer craft beer. <laughs> and I don't like craft beer. I... I I would rather drink someone else's piss than IPA. I just, blech, I don't like it. So, uh, so I've often been in the position that Jay Cole's in here of sort of like trying to explain to a man, hey, this is what's happening and you don't have to be this way and this is how things to get better. I'm swearing a lot in this review. I know people, I, people like it when I swear and they don't. And I am a real professor, but also, you know, I'm also just a, a dude who grew up swearing all the time. Uh, I once asked my brother, what's the worst swear? And he said, fucking A. And then I said, so <laughs> is fucking B worse? And he laughed and laughed. Uh, but I wasn't joking. That was a real question. Next track is another cut. Oh my God. I thought I cut you already, R&B. Oh, no thank you. Just, uh-oh. Just the 80s keyboards, uh-oh. Uh, just this Tate Cobang uh, talking about putting your ass to sleep. It's just like, I don't need sex. Ice Cube came up with that line, <laughs> what, 30 years ago? I don't need to hear it now. And then, and then her verse is mostly about her body. 
you know, we don't make love, we fuck, like, all right, you love me, tattoo your whole name, okay, and Lil Wayne comes on, and I love Lil Wayne's features, but I don't love this one, it's all about popping pussy, and it's just boring, about to buy a fake booty for a real ass bitch, just, ah, bleh, bleh, don't like it, it, Next track is another cut, Pink Birthday. This is, I think, this is this could be on this album. This is the most Pink Friday 1 sounding album, uh, song on the album here. And, you know, it's your party, you can do what you want to. Uh, I hate references to that song, and he can eat the cake, and he can jack off too if he wants. I don't know. It's okay. It's okay. But... It doesn't inspire me. Next track is that track that I can't even finish. I forget what I called it. I think I called it a steaming pile of something. I'm not going to swear because swearing is beneath me at this point. Uh, I'm just going to say that this song, Needle, featuring Drake, is a truly lamentable piece of non-culture trash. Okay? I didn't swear. It's like a kind of reggaeton style sequencer rhythm. And just when Drake comes in with this girl out of flow, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't make it through one listen. So, hey, maybe there's a, a beat switch in the middle and it gets awesome and Drake does something cool. I don't care. I, I hate the song so much. It's making me angry. <laughs> Feeling a lot of emotions, you know? I'm crying at the first song and I'm mad at this next song. And, but hey... Fortunately, we're not going to skip Cowgirl. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, Sky, you're all about the monster and the real and the real. How do you like Cowgirl? I like Cowgirl because it's not just a pop song. It's a good pop song. This cool, like, tight drum line and this clean guitar line. Very, very catchy chorus. It's kind of a sex song, but it's good. It's, <laughs> it's got this, like, legitimate eroticism to it. He's going to look me in the eyes and I'm going to ride him cowgirl. It's sung by this person, Lourdes. Lourdes? I don't know. But it, that's a sexy line, right? Because it's implying intimacy, right? It's not just saying like, hit it from the back, right? It's like implying like actual eye-to-eye -eye intimacy in the sex act. And even though it's a, it's a sex song and ride him like a rodeo and all that stuff, it's, uh, it's very effective. It's very good. Um, this just it really is based on how good and ethereal this chorus is but also like the the second verse from nikki is great she's kind of growling in the first bit in the second half she goes in that kind of high barbie style um wait so this is the one where she says i'm the sleaze telling him okay prove it right or is that a previous song no it's not sorry i accidentally copied the wrong lyrics in here and then they do this trick which is so I didn't, I didn't look at the credits uh, all the way through. So I first listened to this song. I'm like, damn, this is a well-done well, well done pop song. I'm like, I bet this is by like some great pop producer. And if you know who produced it, you know that uh-oh is coming up. Uh, because they do a thing where they play the chorus like the third or fourth time. And you're like, damn, I love this chorus. And then there's this little bridge, which is basically nothing. <laughs> It's like, it's like never to be you or you're never, never going to be better than you. It doesn't matter at all. It's just an excuse to hear anything that's not the chorus. So they could do what? Paf, bring the chorus back and look you in the eyes while it rides you, cowgirl. Damn, this is great. Oh, I can't wait to see who produced this. Dr. Luke. Got me again. Why couldn't it have been Benny Blanco? Why couldn't it have been anybody but Dr. Luke? Why does that unfortunate, abusive jerk have to be so good at his job is he not the phil, Sp phil specter of the 21st century Ooh, i didn't think about that before i said it <sighs> that might be going too far i don't i don't stand by that sentence i do stand by that question next track everybody another keeper featuring uh little uzi vert weird i listened to him like what is this like a weird 80s uh like european game show I was close. It's a track uh, called Everybody by Junior Senior. It was a, like a song that was from Denmark in 2002. I listened to it to hear the original sample. I sort of remember hearing it back then. And it's just a cool hype song. And, and it does this cool trick where the word everybody is repeated over and over again. Homestar style. 
uh, you know, we're going to spin and kill everybody, like taking from the sample. But then there's this really cool thing where during the chorus, they just sample body of everybody. So it's really neat. It's like, a, it's a neat trick because you're just, you're, you're tagging every line with a bit from this sample, but then it just becomes body. Pretty face with a Barbie doll. Body. Every year, another Vince Lom body. So it's like, <laughs> it's because his name is Vince Lombardi. But they take body, so it's Vince Lombardi. But like it works, like th that. Like she's sort of playing 4D chess with like words and like samples here because she's <laughs> she's making like a forced weird rhyme with a word that doesn't actually rhyme. It's really great. Maybe this sort of reminds me a little bit of uh, of the sort of Beyonce. Uh, that Drake album from a couple years ago, honestly, never mind. The sort of a housey European movement happening here. I like this album too because she's never like just straight riding waves, but she touches on a lot of waves. She's sort of like, she's like, like there's like some currents of music and she's sort of following them, but she doesn't like go full in. A multi-millionaire homebody. It's a great lyric, and then little little Uzi. Vert's verse comes out. And, and you know, I missed Lil Uzi Vert's height. So he has a lot of fans who, as far as I... <laughs> if you started paying attention to music in 2018, your impression of Lil Uzi Vert is he is a, a very popular person who every single one of his fans hates him completely. That's my, that's my impression of Lil Uzi Vert. Uh, but he was, he's great here. I sort of understand the chaotic appeal of him. Just during his whole verse, his verse just gets crazy. So it's echoing and echoing. It gets really avant-garde and bizarre here. I love it. Next track is The Stamp. Big difference. That's another keeper. Red Ruby Das Lees is another keeper. It's not on the high end. Weird voices in the back has some tap dancing. Maybe again reminding us of the Kendrick Lamar album. Um, nice kind of odd sample in the back, which comes back. She makes reference to Chun-Li, which was another one of the Nicki Minaj songs that I heard and liked. Um, many different voices that she's using here. Uh, she does a little bit of sort of like, I mean, let's remember, okay? Sky's political soapbox here, 60 minute soapbox. Um, you can't like hip hop culture or rap music or anything that comes from hip hop music and rap culture and be against immigration. Can't do it, I'm sorry. Find another genre to like because rap music would not exist without the Caribbean and without Caribbean immigrants. Just wouldn't exist. Would not, would not, would not be there. It would not exist. Okay, there'd be something else. It's not like, not like African American culture wasn't capable of coming up with amazing new musical genres every 10, 15 years, but hip hop, as it was created, would never have existed without the Caribbean and without Caribbean immigration into New York. And Nicki Minaj, coming from Trinidad, is a great reminder that that continues to this day. She's not Cool Herc or <laughs> Mr. Flash going all the way back to the 70s. She's right there. And so when she integrates some island, uh, some island sounds and rhythms in here, I feel it as being a lot more uh, authentic, and, and I like it in here. And she shouts out Super Cat. Secretly, Dan Dada by Supercat is like a top 10 album of the 1980s. <laughs> or it's actually not really 90s. Really, shit. Doesn't matter. Pretend I correctly said something superlative about the album Dan Dada by Supercat. One of my favorite reggae albums. My friend Brad used to listen. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna do a video about it. I'm, screw it. January sucks. There's no new albums. I'm gonna do a Dan Dada video. No one's gonna watch it, but I don't care. God damn, I love Supercat. Another old reference, <laughs> just a bunch of airheads like Kelly Bundy. Hey, I love Married with Children too, but you gotta make references the kids understand. Stick with the on red thing. Next track is another track we're keeping, Forward from Trini, uh, which has a dance hall beat. It's kinda poppy, but it's great because it's, you know, she's from Trinidad. She's reminding you of the island, her island roots. She has a couple uh, Jamaican DJs, whatever, Jamaican rappers. Uh, performers, Skillabang and Skang. I prefer Skang a lot more. Uh, he has a cool kind of growling, menacing sound. It gets a little sleepy at times during Nikki's verse, but I like him when she just shouts out the countries, Trinidad, Jamaica, Guyana, Barbados, Bahamas, St. Thomas, Turks and Caicos, Belize, St. Kitts, Haiti. Uh, it seems like it's whatever, but how many times are those places shouted out? How many times have you heard Guyana shouted out in a rap song? I'll wait. Never happened.
so I like hearing it. Is there an accordion on this song? <laughs> there is. Uh, next track is another cut, Pink Friday Girls. Listen, I understand. Puff Daddy walked so that you could run. Doing lazy-ass samples of pop hits is an easy way to get streams. I get it. I get it. And Drake does it too. Uh, but I don't need another version of Girls Just Wanna Have Fun. Okay, I do actually. I, I like this song. Listen, the serious dude who has a PhD and is a super smart guy wants to tell you that this song is way beneath me, but actually, it's pretty well done. It's still going to be a cut, but uh, I said it has all the artistic integrity of a Trolls movie, and I stick with that, but also, so what, why not? Especially the way they add an 80s cowbell, like 808 cowbell sound on here, it's quite nice. Real question is, does Cyndi Lauper make money off this? Because she didn't write the song. The song was written by a dude. A fact which haunts me and makes me sort of angry. <laughs> Next track is another cut. It's not as, it's called Super Freaky Girl. I saw it said Super Freaky Girl. I'm like, okay, so this is just going to be a Rick James sample. It is, but it's not a completely straightforward MC Hammer style sample. Uh, you know, talking about doing all these tricks with the dick, which frankly just makes me, <laughs> just makes me anxious. Just, just anyways, just... whole process works itself out but anyways and she does this whole thing where she like spells out the word freak and it kind of reminds me of jack harlow i know that it's copying uh that he was copying fergie um the next track is bomb bomb which another shock much like beep beep i thought it was going to be uh, uh missy ellie i thought this was going to be a little nancy thing what the bomb bomb but it's not but this is some of her best rapping on here cool low voice solid flow whispering and then louder uh, I love the chorus. Made him drop his bitches uh, just from pussy pictures. Bomb, bomb. Made him meet me. We don't swap positions. We don't talk on the phone. We don't put cops in the business. Bomb, bomb. Great bomb, bomb style here. Great chorus. It's not much of a song, you know. It's kind of a song et, but it's nice. Next track is My Life, a uh, cover of the um, uh, John Lennon song. It's not. I'm joking. Uh, low bass sound. Oh, this album was released on John Lennon's uh, anniversary of his death cool like wood sounds here this is another cut it's fine it, it it does the best job of of interpreting a more popular song from the 80s you know the song heart of glass by blondie it's a neat idea but it's well done but it just doesn't live up to the rest of the songs that i think are great next track is another cut Nicki hendrix because future's on it but future's boring she's boring i don't need to, i don't this, this is bad next track is another cut but it's also like a what the hell. Like, it's kind of a slow beat. And then like halfway through, like, make no mistake, his name is Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. Who, who brought Jesus into this? That was a bad spit take. You can tell I didn't go to improv class. Wh Jesus? <laughs> We're talking about Jesus? We're talking about Jesus? <laughs> Why are we talking about Jesus? Anyways, it's cool. Hey, I'm a big fan of Jesus myself. Uh, uh, but it's unexpected. Then we get the last couple tracks. Last time I saw you, what I like. This is going to be a keeper, even though it's not the best song. But the 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 soundtrack reminds me of, like I said, she touches on waves, but she doesn't ride them. So the kind of real instrument, little yachty kind of thing that's happening here. Like a, the hi hat is not a trap hi hat. It's like an actual sloppy, like real hi hat. Cool guitars and it's just, it's nice. It's almost like indie pop at times. And then the final track is a keeper, Just the Memories. Kind of neat, sort of like 80s reggae sounds, kind of whispering, like... The singing here, for some reason, I don't mind it. And the rap style is my least favorite kind of her rap style, just sort of like straight rap style, but still. She tells these stories about her first, like, crush dying of being stabbed in the neck by a switchblade, which... Does I'm not going to call Cap because I don't know her life, uh, which is a fancy young way of saying uh, it's a lie, but like a switchblade? <laughs> was it, like, was your first crush James Dean in Rebel Without a Cause? <laughs> but I like how she interpolates memory, um, 
memories don't live like people do. The Beanie Man song that was sampled by Kanye, because uh, it's a really nice theme. Like just the, like that, it's such a great lyric. It deserves to be everywhere. Memories don't live like people do. Uh, and then at the end, it seems as though she's rapping about her own death. And it's weird. It's almost like it's a song that is intentionally written for in memoriam sections of Nicki Minaj. But you know, she has, she talks about how she could have overdosed. I'm glad that she didn't. I gotta throw more respect on my Patreon's names here. Um, yeah, so I, I, I like this ending. I like this idea that she has of having this sort of uh, emotional opener and emotional ender. These are my Patreons, they help me buy music. I don't know if I'll buy this album. Um, pro probably not. I'm still burned from Pink Friday 1. But I do think I'm going to be listening to more uh, Nicki Minaj. I think I need to go back to, to Pink Print. Why don't you tell me in the comments, like, is her best project the, the Roman Reloaded? Like, what, what, what is it? Like, if I want just, like, all the monstery stuff, you know, what, what do I got to do? So anyways, thank you to my Patreons. Got a new one down there. Thank you, Frank is boring. Not boring to me. And uh, until next time. Until next time, there's the camera. Wait, I find this, I'm finally rocking it right. I, I shit could have worn like this the whole time. Okay. <laughs> Until next time, there's the camera.